Mina, oh hell yes, I'm Jesus freaking gamer here. Yeah, did another one of my long late nights and early morning things again. So this is Friday stuff. I know I'm very well aware it's Saturday. Please be aware I did not sleep. I have not gone to bed yet. For me, this is the end of my Friday, which will shortly lead into my Saturday after a good uh, day's sleep. So, today I'm coming at you with Ezra chapter 9. Some of the things I say today may not be the most popular, but I do believe them to be true. I believe them to be credible. And uh, if anyone would disagree with me, I would challenge them. Would you please challenge me with Scripture? Outside of the Bible, what I'm going to say is pretty meaningless. Of course, since the message that I'm preaching is from the Bible, it would if the Bible was removed from the equation altogether, it would be a little ridiculous one way or the other. Um, I don't. I'm not here to preach culture or opinion. Although I will admit, I am preaching my interpretation of the Word of God. I am here to preach the Word of God. Let's go on with this message. It's um, Ezra chapter nine. We're going to start with verse one. When these things were done, that is getting all the stuff in chapter 8 done, I won't rehash that at this time, the leaders came to me saying, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites. For they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the peoples of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. Uh, and this was the leaders. Going back to verse 1, this is the leaders that came to him and told him this. So apparently they, uh, they were acknowledging this problem amongst themselves, this sin within their own ranks. Verse 3, So when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And I sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. So he is set, he sits in astonishment at the fact that some Israelis have married some of the ites of the land. There are several ites that I just mentioned, uh, and that, that's kind of a church term for all of the peoples of the land of Canaan, and indeed other Gentiles and heathens of that time. And he sat in astonishment that the Holy Seed was mixed with the Gentile and heathen seed, and it was a shocking thing. Now, this message is not actually about race. Um, this, What I just said was a setup for what I am going to say. And race actually would not be the big problem here. The bigger problem would be, as I mentioned earlier on, the abominations of those lands. The fact that they were a certain race was not the problem. The fact that they were worshiping other gods, the fact that they were living a cultural life other than the cultural life prescribed by the Word of God. Those would be the problems. Were they worshipers and followers and obeyers of Yahweh or not? Race was not the issue. The Holy Seed would be those who follow God and love God, mixing with those who do not love God and who do not follow God. Uh, it is mentioned just for context earlier on in the Law of Moses that it's someone, uh, a foreigner, a Gentile, such as myself, I am not of Jewish descent, they could come into the Israeli community and abide by their laws and worship their God. And marriage, I don't know the exact verse where it is, but marriage and acceptance of such a person was completely within the bounds of the law. And Ezra sits there in astonishment, like, how, how could the people do this thing? Why would they marry someone who doesn't follow our God? Why would they do this? And in today's church, it seems natural, I think, to accept various, and in my opinion, many sinful activities. Marriage to a non-Christian? Well, of course. I mean, we're surrounded by we're surrounded by tons of beautiful people. Uh, I, from a man to a to a woman, it would be like surrounded by beautiful women. You marry a non-Christian? Well. Doggone it, you know, I guess what's probably bound to happen, they outnumber the Christians. A lot of the times they, they're mighty fine and they, they offer various things that the Christian girls don't offer, like sex. Uh, so, bound to happen, you know, we'll pray for the Lord to, to mend that marriage and to heal that, that person. 
and I'm all for I'm all for praying for people who are in trouble and that need help and who have fallen into sin. Absolutely. But there is a certain holy reverence that Ezra demonstrates here, that astonishment at why did the people of God fall into this sin that is sorely lacking in the church today. When we hear, you know, this pastor committed adultery, we don't think, my gosh, that's terrible. We think, eh, yeah, it's another one, another one of those. You know, someone in the in the majority of the pastors, we hear about a televangelist committing fraud. Uh, we don't think, how could you steal from people? That's thievery. That's clearly against the standards of God. We just think, yeah, it's pretty much par and course for the pastors. Uh, if, uh, if someone in the church comes out as a homosexual, we try to um, think about, you know, how to embrace them, how to help them, you know, what should we do? How should we deal with it? Uh, homosexuality is a sin. It's wrong. It's to be condemned. It is not an acceptable life choice. If a woman has an abortion, well, it probably wasn't her time in life. No, she killed her child. It was a sin. It was murder. To be very, very specific, I am all for forgiving sin. I am all for loving the sinner. But when that person doesn't even acknowledge that what they've done is wrong, it is our duty as Christians to step forward and say, what you've done is not acceptable. We love you, and we want you to do what's right, but what you've done is not right. Uh, <laughs> so I was going to say, you know, you can keep coming to the church, but please don't think that we're tolerating your behavior. Sometimes, sometimes, 1 Corinthians 5 is my witness, sometimes it is the right thing to kick them out of the church. There are some behaviors that if you call yourself a Christian are not to be accepted, are not to be tolerated. Those actions are to be condemned morally and biblically. Some actions are sin. They're not just oopsies. They're not just mistakes. They are wrong. I don't expect a non-Christian to live by our lifestyle, but when I hear about a leader in the church, a leader doing something like, you know, adultery or fornication or homosexuality or, you know, um, money laundering or thieving or lying to the congregation, something along those lines, it's not, oh, well, he's another one of them. Ah, it's human nature. It can't be helped. Well, you know, they're... Plenty of pretty women around. It's not really a shocker. It should be a shocker. There should be a holy reverence and an astonishment when those godly standards aren't met. I don't know to what degree. I'm not suggesting a certain degree of, you know, slack jawedness and googly eyedness. I'm not suggesting certain, certain reactions to certain sins. I'm not trying to set forth a metric or a barometer of some kind. I'm simply saying when someone falls into sin, it shouldn't be, oh, that's par for the course, that's pretty normal. No, it should be, my gosh, that's terrible. That's wrong. Does this person know it's a sin? And if they're a leader, they certainly should know it's a sin. Why do they do that? that that's, that's disgusting, that's horrible. You know, we need to pray for them that they repent quickly and come back to the Lord swiftly. It's not something to tolerate. It's not something to accept. It's something to point out as sin, rebuke, and condemn. And if they're not willing to repent of their sin, maybe even consider cutting off fellowship. Today was a bit of a heavy message, and that it, that's what I got from the text. That's what I saw. I'm sure I stepped on some people's feet, and I won't apologize for any hurt feelings, because this is the Word of God. This is the Bible. This is God's law. And I'm not going to apologize for what I believe, and I'm not going to apologize for standing up against what is wrong and standing up for what is right. The culture and the law does not determine right and wrong. God alone determines that. So guys, thank you very much for watching this video. Hopefully, hopefully this can inspire some godly reverence and even some godly astonishment, where in many circumstances in today's modern church, it is sorely, sorely needed. I love you, and God bless.